I've long been a fan of turn-based combat, but sadly, generally speaking, they have become somewhat of a rarity in recent years. These days, games are more focused towards having constant action every single second while you play. There is nothing wrong with that, it is perfectly fine, and enjoyable, but sometimes it's nice to just take your time. Let the reflexes have a rest and give the brain a bit of a workout instead. It's days like that where I do enjoy a good turn-based game. So when I do happen to come across such a game, it is something of a rare treat for me, and one that I can't help but indulge myself in. And the game we're looking at today is one such game. Emberlight is a turn-based roguelike dungeon crawler developed and published by indie developer Quarter Onion Games. It released on August 13, 2019 for PC, Mac, Linux and Steam OS. Emberlight has a very steep learning curve along with a number of issues, but push through those difficulties and you will find an enjoyable roguelite that's unique mechanics set it apart from that of the rest of the genre. Before we get started I would like to note that while recording footage for this review, Quarter Onion Games released a big update that made quite a number of changes to the UI and camera of the game, therefore the footage you will see will change between the new and old UI. To clarify, this is the old UI. And this is the brand new UI that came with the October update. With that all cleared up, let's get started. There is no plot to Emberlight as such, at least at the moment that is. I believe there is one to be implemented in a future update as suggested by the faded out menu option for a story mode that can be found in the brand new main menu that came with the October update. In Emberlight you are a party of Knights of the Ember Order. A group of warriors, psionics and magic users who have the ability to absorb the skills of their enemies by observing them. By absorbing enemy skills they gain the ability to use those skills themselves in combat. But such power comes at a great cost. The objective of Emberlight is to complete the quests that the Order has available to you. Each of these quests is a completely new playthrough where your parties start from scratch in typical roguelike fashion. There is a total of 10 quests to embark on and complete. At the beginning of the game you will only have a few quests unlocked and available to play. As you level up you will unlock others but we will get into the levelling up of Emberlight shortly. Each of the quests has a difficulty rating associated with it, starting at easy and going right up to very hard. The difficulty changes the length of a playthrough and in later more challenging quests the enemy types that you will face. The objective of each of these quests is to find the boss that is on the final floor of the dungeon and defeat it, with each quest having its own unique boss. The difficulty rating of a quest determines how many floors there are, with there being either 1, 2 or 3. As of the October update, the first and second floor has a possibility of two different environments. The first floor will either be the forest environment or the runes environment. The second floor has a choice of generating either the caves or the sewers. The third remains the same single environment of the catacombs. Each of the quests presents a whole new and varied playthrough to experience, as with each one there is a unique boss to defeat along with the difficulty greatly increasing with each new quest unlocked. With each of the quests having a set number of floors to complete, it allows for players to have either a quick playthrough with a spare 15 minutes, or go on a long run that can last up to 60. So whether you're sitting down to play for a short duration or a proper gaming session, Emberlight allows for either. The October update did introduce a save system, where you can save and exit in the middle of a playthrough. However, at the time of writing, the system is currently broken. Upon loading back up your playthrough, a bug will cause the next battle to break, forcing you to end the run through the pause menu. So until this issue is solved, you need to finish a playthrough in one sitting as you always had to do in the game. The addition of the new environments is fantastic, as prior to that each and every playthrough felt the same. While I do wish there were more environments for the game to choose from, the new ones certainly help break up the visual monotony and give a breath of fresh air. As a whole, the concept and general design of the quests are fantastic each offering something new to experience along with new challenges. While environmentally the playthroughs are limited, what is available does help increase the replayability that the quests already give. With the number of quests available, Ember Knight has a ton of replayability that will keep you busy for more than just a few hours. Then there is the previously mentioned level up system. How this works is that upon completing a quest you will gain corruption points. The amount of corruption points you gain is dependent on a number of factors including the length of the run along with how high of a score you obtain in the playthrough. Gaining score points is done through a large array of categories including cleared rooms, cleared mini bosses, cleared bosses, gold in your inventory, the number of enemies killed, the time it took to complete and many many more. The more points you gain the more corruption points you earn per run. 
you need to gain 300 corruption points in order to level up. This applies to each and every level with there being no increase to the amount needed the more you level up. I believe there is currently a total of 30 levels. Each time you level up you unlock new content in the game. The content you unlock differs from level to level and includes new rooms generating on the map that were previously unavailable, new mini bosses, unlocking new quests and new character classes to choose from. This is where the whole roguelite aspect of the game comes into play. As you gain levels the new content gives you additional advantages that were previously unavailable to you. For example, the rooms that are a mine allow you to mine for gold after clearing out the enemies in it, giving you a large boost to your gold that you otherwise wouldn't have. And that is just one example. Each of these new rooms grants new possibilities, but like with any roguelike, no advantage comes free of charge. In some of these rooms, such as the graveyard or the orc outpost, there is the potential to gain additional supplies, but the likeliness of you being attacked by enemies is quite high. So you need to consider all possibilities before acting straight out of greed. This is a fantastic mechanic that consistently introduces new elements and contact to the game the more you play. Therefore, the more you play the game, the more challenging and complex it becomes. The downfall to having it work this way, however, is that for the first few hours there isn't much variation in the playthroughs, and your enjoyment is based solely on the gameplay and novelty. It's only when you start gaining levels and unlocking new content does the game start to increase in general variety and interest. The other issue I would have with the mechanic is that you don't start unlocking new character classes until level 20. Now, gaining 20 levels each requiring only 300 corruption points each may not sound like a lot, but when you do the mathematics taking into consideration the average points you gain per run and the length of each run, it is a bloody long time. As an example, I am currently level 5 and I have spent nearly 10 hours at the game upon making this review. It likely wouldn't take 40 hours to reach level 20, as by then you'll be taking on the more challenging quests and gaining more points per run, but nevertheless it will still take a good 20 odd hours before you start to unlock new classes which is disappointing. Up until then you will only have the 4 base classes to choose from, while if the developer spread out the class unlocks a bit more, it would really add a whole new level of variety to the game much earlier on. Other than those issues however, as a system and mechanic it works very well, bringing fresh and new interesting content to the game the more you play. It gives a real sense of being rewarded for your efforts and your commitment to the game. Upon selecting your quest you will be brought to the character selection screen. Here you get to choose what three classes to have in your party. There are four base character class types in Emberlight, the fourth one added in the October update. They are the Blaze Knight, Pyromancer, Ember Maiden and Smoke Shrouded. The Blaze Knight is a melee tank character who deals decent amounts of damage while being able to withstand massive amounts of punishment. The Pyromancer is the magic caster that is relatively weak in health and defense but makes up for it with raw power and decent dodge. The Smoke Shrouded are primarily used as psionic powers that are often used to debuff enemies. They are relatively weak in attack power but have very high dodge rates allowing them to evade attacks much more frequently than others. Finally is the Ember Maiden who plays more of a support role in the party such as buffing and healing party members. They're also not too bad at damaging enemies either. Each of the four character types has two subclasses that start to unlock as I previously mentioned upon gaining level 20 or higher. Each of the subclasses varies from that of the original, generally granting either more raw power over defense or where they play more of a supportive role. You don't have to have three different characters in a party either. You can have three blaze knights if you wanted, with there even being an achievement for doing it. But generally speaking, the more variance in your party, the more options you have available to you. The choice of what classes you bring on a quest isn't entirely up to you, but each of them have their own very distinct advantages and disadvantages. There is quite a level of customization when it comes to selecting your party, and this is ever more the case when you begin to unlock the additional subclasses after level 20. It allows you to experiment and figure out what class combos best work for you in specific quests, giving quite an unusual amount of freedom for a roguelike game. The one thing I'd have an issue with when it comes to the character classes is that their portraits don't really work with the in-game character models. This is especially the case with the Ember Maiden who in-game looks a lot like a female spectre as opposed to a magic casting member of the Ember Order. Not only that but she shares no physical resemblance to the other characters either. The other character classes look like devils more than humans with their red skin despite their portraits representing that of humans. It is quite jarring. But with that said, it's something I can live with, as it doesn't impact the general gameplay or experience itself. It is more of a minor eyebrow razor than anything else. I hope that sometime in the future, however, new character models will be made to better fit the new portraits. Upon choosing your party members, you will be brought to the buy screen. Here you have a total of 1000 gold to spend as you see fit. It can be used to buy health potions or to buy additional skills for your characters to start off with. The potions each cost 100 gold, while the skills range from 200 to 3600 each. 
what skills are available is completely randomly generated each time. It is possible to return to the shop during play by finding a portal room, allowing you to buy more expensive skills assuming you have the gold. Once you've done your shopping, you're ready to get stuck into your new run. The shop doesn't make a huge difference to your party at the beginning of the playthrough, but having a few extra skills right from the get-go does give you a helping hand when your party are relatively weak at the beginning. This is especially the case if the RNG is good to you and gives you a good few of the skills that are within your budget. It's a small addition, but one that can really make a difference from the start. Finally, we're at the meat of the game, with the workings of the general gameplay. How Ember Light works is that in true roguelike fashion, you need to move from room to room making your way to the boss of the floor that is generally found on the other side of this series of rooms. You need to defeat this boss to either complete the run or move to the next floor if the quest has more than one floor to it. The base rooms, those that are available from the start, are as follows. Combat rooms where you face off against a party of standard enemies. Mini boss rooms where your party fights against a mini boss. Treasure rooms that contain a chest with gold and health potions. Ember shard rooms where you find ember shards that grant your party a new skill. Tavern room where you can buy temporary stat boosting drinks. The gambling room where you can gamble your money in hopes of doubling it. The portal rooms that allow you to return to the order shop and buy additional potions and skills and even heal or resurrect a dead party member for a price of course. A campsite where you can rest your party to heal them. And finally the trap room that contains a chest but upon opening it, it has the potential to trigger a trap that can damage your party or add negative statuses on them. The further you level up in the game the more varied the rooms become as you unlock new ones. But most, especially the new ones you unlock, come with their own advantages, disadvantages and dangers that must be summed up before making the decision as to whether it is worth investigating them or not. That is of course, if you even have that option as sometimes you need to go through them in order to make your way to the boss. How you make your way through the series of rooms and whether or not you branch off to additional optional rooms is entirely your decision. While the map generally doesn't branch off too far from the path of the boss, it is nevertheless a nice design choice that gives the player a bit of freedom not to mention a small additional bit of strategy to the overall gameplay. Then there is the combat of Emberlight, and it is here that the game truly starts to show its uniqueness. The combat consists of party turn based combat similar to that of a JRPG. The initiative stat of each member of your party and the enemies is taken into account. Each character starting from the highest initiative down to the lowest will take their turn one by one. During a turn a character can attack normally, defend increasing their dodge, use a health potion or use one of their available skills. This is all pretty standard of the style of combat and works very well. However, what makes the combat so unique and different in Ember Light is that as an enemy uses one of their skills, there is a chance that your party will successfully observe it. Up to 10 skills can be observed in a single battle with it being possible to observe the same skill multiple times. When the battle is over, assuming you won, you can take those observed skills and have your party absorb them, applying them to each of their skill bars as you see fit. Each party member can have up to 10 skills at any one time. This system also applies to bosses and mini bosses who both have exceptionally powerful skills that can really help you if you can get them. Unlike with normal enemies, you only get one shot per run to observe and absorb boss skills. Most games with RPG elements have a character level up system, but Emberlight doesn't. Instead they gain increases to their stats and health through the skills they obtain. Each skill has its own increases to stats and health depending on its power and rarity. The rarity of skills starts from normal and goes right up to legendary. With the rarer it is, the more damage and other special effects it has, along with how much it increases your character's stats. Having such a system creates a massive amount of customization to your party, along with added complexity to your strategy and tactics in each battle. With the skills you obtain being your method of character development, you need to decide when it is time to sit back and defend and observe your enemy's attacks and when you bring the attack to them. It is a unique system that is incredibly satisfying to use and extremely fun to experiment with. The problem with the skills is that some of their descriptions are not very clear. This is especially the case with skills that affect both you and your enemy when used. It is hard to tell how it affects both. Along with that, I found that some skills when used damage the enemy, but also buff them. The fast strike skill is a perfect example of this, where upon hitting and damaging the enemy, it grants them haste. I would have thought it would have granted your character the haste buff, not the enemy based on its description. Either this is an error in clarity with the description, or some of the skills are not working as intended. The best solution to the clarity with descriptions would be to highlight direct effects and self effects separately, so you know exactly how it affects the enemies and you. At present, the descriptions don't do this well at all making some of the skills very trial and error. Each time you absorb a skill from an enemy, the character you apply to gains corruption. 
How this works is that as you gain more corruption, it begins to change the character. I suppose you could say it starts to turn them evil. Upon reaching 25 corruption, which is displayed on the bottom of the three bars in each character's display, you will gain a corrupt trait. There are a number of different possible traits that can be applied to a character. This trait will start at level 1, but for every additional 25 corruption gained, it will increase by 1 level to a maximum of 4. These traits grant heavy bonuses to the character, but generally come with downfalls too. For example, the corrupt vampire trait increases the character's initiative, but lowers their armor. The higher the trait becomes, the more bonuses it gains, and at level 4 you gain a new skill that is exclusive to that trait. However, there is another downfall to gaining corruption. At the end of a quest, assuming you were successful, the corruption will begin to take control of the party, and they will begin attacking each other. The character with the most corruption will face off against the other two. If defeated, the next character with the highest corruption will start to fight the other. If the character with the higher corruption wins the fight, they become what is called a corrupted boss. Corrupted bosses make a return at some point in the game, most likely in the higher difficulty quests where your party will have to defeat them, though I am yet to come across one. There is supposed to be a different ending which is obtained by doing a pure run, which is where the whole party don't gain any corruption at all, though this makes things exceptionally difficult even in the easier quests, as the party can't gain any additional skills from enemies. The idea of the corruption is a very interesting and unique one, adding an additional layer of complexity to the character development and combat. Each corrupt trait does grant exceptional power, but also greatly weakens the character in some way too. You generally need to consider how far you're willing to bring that character down that path and if it is worth it, along with if it will work in advantage with the rest of your party. I also love how the character's physical appearance changes as their corruption level increases too. Their colour begins to change to a shade of blue and their eyes begin to glow red. It really works well and gives the player a glimpse as to how the power of Ember takes its toll on its wielder when used irresponsibly. There are also other traits that can be granted to your party party other than just the corrupt ones. As your party gains skills, they gain bonus traits depending on the types of skills they've obtained. An example of one trait would be physical mastery that increases the damage of your physical attacks by 5 times the normal damage, but that is just one and there are loads more. The combination and the skills needed to gain these traits are kept secret, and the player needs to figure them out for themselves through experimentation. While having to figure out the trait combinations without help isn't to everyone's taste, it is nevertheless extremely satisfying and rewarding when you do finally realise how they work. And like with many other mechanics of the game, the traits too add additional complexity and depth. Then there is Fury. Fury is gained every time a character deals or takes damage. The Fury meter is the middle blue bar on each of the characters. When full, a character on their turn can use a Fury skill, assuming they have one. Fury skills are exceptionally powerful attacks that grant massive bonuses or deal huge amounts of damage. Attempting to get these skills by observing enemies is very dangerous, as they have to be used on your party, but the reward of obtaining them is well worth the risk and effort. Fury skills are another addition to the complexity of Emberlight's combat. Not only do you have to keep the enemy's fury level in check, but obtaining such skills to use to your advantage is a challenge all in their own. It adds ever more to the already staggering amount of strategy and depth that the combat already has. There are also difficulty settings in the game. Through the options menu you can change the difficulty setting to suit your preferred level of challenge. The difficulties range from easy right up to impossible. How they affect the gameplay is that the higher the difficulty setting is, the stronger and more durable enemies and bosses of the game become. For example, in normal difficulty bosses gain immunity to status changes, meaning they cannot be stunned, confused or anything along those lines. Hard difficulty includes mini bosses with this rule. The higher you go up in difficulty from there, normal enemies start to gain additional bonus too, with their stats and health. In very hard they gain a 50% increase to their health and stats, while with impossible they gain a 100% increase to both. So whether you're a beginner of turn based combat or a masochistic veteran, there is a difficulty setting to suit each and every skill level. Along with the standard quest run there is also daily challenges to embark on. Each day a new challenge is generated with its own unique rules and modifiers. As an example of modifiers there are times where your entire party will start with full corruption, or they may start with 10 randomly selected skills each. Others include things like the Ember Plague, where you need to finish the challenge within 60 minutes or the plague will kill the party. The challenge mode is a nice little addition that gives you a completely new scenario to play through each and every day, that helps bring a twist to the standard playthrough. It adds a whole new level of replayability to the game, along with new and interesting ways of playing a run while giving a decent challenge in the process. There are other modes planned for the game in the future these modes being the previously mentioned story mode along with multiplayer modes such as co-op and dungeon master mode, though I don't know any exact details on those modes right now. Nevertheless, they are sure to bring the game to a whole new level when they are implemented. Overall, the gameplay to Emberlight is fantastic. 
It is unique, massively in-depth, complex and most of all a ton of fun to play. The skill system and how your party absorb enemy skills mixed with the corruption system is both fascinating and an absolute joy to experience and experiment with and really separate Emberlight from anything else out there. It does have some issues. As previously stated, the save function isn't working at this time. Skills need their descriptions fixed up for better clarity, to help make it clear whether they're working as intended or that some of them are bugged or not. The game would also benefit from a separate tutorial level. While I'm generally someone who enjoys figuring things out for myself in games, others wouldn't have the patience I would. With the game being so unique, having a tutorial level for new players to play through as an option is something I would strongly suggest. Along with that there is also a bug when characters are confused. If you happen to click the attack button as the confused characters run towards their target, they become stuck in their running animation forcing you to end their run. This appears to only happen with Blaze Knight however. There is certainly still a great deal of polish to be done with the gameplay. Regardless of its roughness, there is plenty to enjoy about Emberlight. And if turn-based combat and roguelikes are to your fancy, I highly recommend giving it a go. The atmosphere of Emberlight is decent. Throughout an entire run there is that sense that you're dealing with dark forces and that evil lurks around every corner. This is intensified by the soundtrack that complements the theme of the darkness with slight horror tones running through it. It works okay even if it isn't exactly anything outstanding. Where the soundtrack truly comes into its own to heighten the atmosphere however is with the boss fights. There are a number of different tracks for the boss fights but each and every one of them creates a sense of urgency and intensity and really makes it feel like you're fighting off against something very powerful. They are fantastic moments. Other than that however, it only just does the job and doesn't really give that sense of unease and darkness that it so desperately attempts to pull off. Sometimes the atmosphere works and others it doesn't. But when it does, it works brilliantly. Ember Light is one of those rare occurrences where my first impressions were a case of being unimpressed. In fact there was a point where I didn't like it at all. But the more I played it and the more I figured out its workings, the more I began to enjoy it. And by the time I came to writing this review, I was loving it. There is no mistake and it is very, and I do mean very, rough around the edges. And there is certainly a lot of polishing to be done. But look past the issues and you'll find a unique game with a staggering amount of complexity and content. It is far from perfect, and it is a game that at first demands a lot of patience. But give it a chance and you'll soon see just how in-depth and well-designed the game is as a whole. It has a ton of content that will keep roguelike and turn-based fans more than happy and keep them returning time and again. And with that, I'll give Emberlight a 7 out of 10. Emberlight is a perfect example that not all games can be judged based on their first impressions. Not all games are a case of being either absolutely awesome or downright terrible from the very beginning. Sometimes you just need to have a bit of patience and persistence. It is like that old saying goes, good come to those who wait. And with Emberlight, that saying couldn't be truer.